Good evening tributes and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. Before I begin you might have noticed that this is part one of the video. Like the last quell there are two parts. Part two though this time is coming on the Thursday instead of the Wednesday because I've got my hands quite full at the moment literally. I'll let you sit down there we go. Uh, with Cleopatra here who uh, literally got yesterday so quite a little bit of work with her but it's all worth it. And um, it will be coming on Thursday, therefore the second part of the video. Um, I'd also like to thank Andrew McLean for all the art that he's produced for this series, as well as my patrons. Your, pi your financial pledge is much appreciated. And also the Hunger Games Discord that is linked to this series, and also another one that's linked to general Hunger Games and gaming. Both of those links are in the description, and there are plenty of other links that you might enjoy if you like this series as well down in the description so feel free to have a look at that without further ado let's go in accordance with the treaty of the reclamation every five years a special set of rules would be incorporated into the hunger games in a special set of games known as a quinquennial quell these games were used to remind the districts of the capital's continuous command over them Almost a week before these games began, President Gaul made a live announcement on Capital TV, in which he announced the conditions for the third quinquennial quell. Gaul stated that in order to remind the districts that they had plotted in secret to rebel against the capital during the reclamation, the tributes that were reaped this year would have their identities kept secret from each other until the games began. Cheers flowed through Snow Square, although many appeared perplexed by how this rule change would be enforced. Gaul went on to say that the tribute's identities would even be kept secret from their district partners and that the events before these games would be somewhat different this year, in order to keep not only the tributes, but their mentals and stylists from learning of each other's identities. Therefore, during the reapings, only the citizens of reapable age would attend, with the females attending the first reaping and the males attending the second. The reaped tributes would be immediately transported to the capital on separate trains, and each tribute along with their mentor and their stylist, would be held together within their apartment until the games began, only being allowed to leave under armed guard for approved activities that prepared them for the games. This would thereby stop any tributes from learning or being informed of their opponents' identities. In order to ensure that the results of this year's reapings were not revealed to tributes from other districts, it was declared that all reapings would take place in quick succession on the same day, with last year's victor, Alicia Heath, being allowed to commentate alongside Eugenia Ravenstill and Ennius Dalton, instead of having to rush between the districts for the reapings. Furthermore, President Gould announced that he had ordered two isolation warehouses be constructed close to the reaping square of each district, with all male youths being placed inside one warehouse and all female youths being placed inside the other, until their district's reaping was complete. As for all other citizens who were not of reaping age, they were sequestered to their own homes, where they watched the reapings on their screens. After a slightly less rowdy pair of reapings occurred in District 14 compared to the previous year, the action moved immediately to District 12, where the sun had only just risen. All females aged between 12 and 18 had just been led to the reaping square, where they were waiting patiently for Mayor Vickers to choose one of them as tribute. Each tribute's mentor also attended their reaping, which meant that Gail Hawthorne, who had been allocated as the mentor for the female tribute of District 12, was sat on the platform and ready to be led to the station with his assigned tribute. Meanwhile, Demetrius Ring, a former member of the Reclaimers, had been assigned to the district as the mentor for the male tribute. Mayor Vickers approached the bowl of female names before blinking in hesitation and reading that 17-year-old Rue Malark was this year's female tribute for District 12. A controversial murmur proceeded through the reaping enclosure and the camera zoomed in upon a young lady with unkempt brown curly hair, who compared to her peers, had clearly not bothered to make as much of an effort with her reaping attire. Rue's glare pierced the camera for a few seconds until a peacekeeper marched into the enclosure and grabbed her by the arm. In a clear show of disobedience, Rue pushed off the peacekeeper's grip before marching in front of him to the platform. Following their parents' death during the 76th Hunger Games, Rue and her brother Crimson had actually been raised by Gail. He was seen to be shaking his head, with a look of despair as Rue approached the platform. 
Eugenia asked Aeneas in a slightly teasing manner if Rue looked familiar, to which he replied with a laugh that she had the same scowl as her mother. Rue shook hands with Mare Vickers, and whilst tears began to form in her eyes, she looked at Gail, who appeared unable to look into her eyes. Without any further delay, they were led into the rather drab town hall behind them, and the female youths were ushered back into the isolation warehouse, so that the reaping of the male youths could take place without the male tribute seeing which females had not been reaped. Once they were inside the town hall, Rue shouted at Gale, rather cryptically asking if he knew that this was going to happen, but he quietly stated that there was nothing he could do. This was indeed correct, as no youth, mentor, or even mayor could compromise the fairness of the reapings. However, Rue flounced off nonetheless, and marched ahead of Gale towards the station. Rue and Gale were then placed on the train, but after a few minutes, the Avox in the main carriage pressed the alarm, as neither Gale nor Rue had arrived within the carriage. Peacekeepers were quickly sent onto the train, and they found the pair talking in hushed tones within the corridor. The peacekeepers proceeded to lead them to the main carriage, and the journey began. As the train ventured into the wilderness beyond District 12, Rue vehemently ripped off the teal dress that Gail insisted she wore each year, and fortunately, she was wearing a dark shirt and trousers beneath. Gail looked shocked as Rue tore the dress to shreds, but she stated that no matter what happened, she would never have to wear it again, and although Gail looked like he was about to protest, he held short upon realising that this was true. He told Rue that she still had a good chance of winning the games, and he would happily bet that no other tribute could be as accurate with a bow and arrow as she was. Yet Rue proceeded to become annoyed, and asked Gail if this was why he had always taken her hunting. He gave her an ironic smile, but said that her mother, Katniss, had a similar reaction before she had gone on to win her games. Rue then asked Gail how her father, Peter, had reacted to being reaped, to which Gail replied that he had not yet met Peter by this point, but he had probably been extremely polite to the peacekeepers and given them each a loaf of bread from his parents' bakery. This made Rue grin and she stated that she could still remember the smell of bread each morning throughout their house in the victor's village, and Gail told Rue that her parents would be proud of how bravely she was acting. However, Gail quickly brought Rue's attention back to the upcoming games, and over the rest of the morning and early afternoon, he tested her on various aspects of the games, such as what each district's speciality was, and their greatest weaknesses, before using the carriage's screen to show her footage of past tributes before they had been killed, and asking how each of them could have avoided death. During their midday meal, Gail showed Rue a message on an electronic screen that had been recorded by her brother, Crimson. Each family of a reap tribute had been allowed to record a message under the careful guard of peacekeepers. These messages were carefully analysed by the keenest capital minds before they were shown to the tributes, in order to confirm that they contained no hidden codes regarding the identities of any other tributes that had been reaped so far. Rue became rather emotional upon seeing her brother, but Gail made her watch the message in full, and when Crimson said that Rue would destroy the careers, Gail said that he was indeed correct. Rue sorrowfully stated that this was the last time that she would ever see her brother, but Gail said that this was incorrect. He then instructed Rue to get some rest before they arrived in the capital that evening, and she withdrew to her carriage. As the sun set over the capital, the train from District 12 arrived in Ravenstill Station, they experienced a slight delay whilst the male tribute from District 5 and his mentor were being escorted from the station by peacekeepers, but minutes later, the signal was given to open the doors to the train, and Rue and Gale stepped onto the platform. Rue immediately asked Gale why he had just been telling her how to react to the crowds for the last 20 minutes, when there was in fact nobody there. Gale replied that he had simply not realised capital citizens would not be allowed to enter the station, in case they revealed any information about the other tribute's identities. Rue breathed out in annoyance, but she and Gail were quickly escorted by peacekeepers through the empty station, with a cameraman in tow. As they walked, Rue initially looked at the camera like she had never seen one before, but Gail could be heard quietly whispering at her to remember what he had said, and as they turned a corner to the car that awaited them, Rue gave a rather sarcastic smile to the camera, which led to Gail telling her off in hushed tones, although he was clearly trying not to laugh as he did this. Strangely, this footage, which was being broadcast live on Capital TV, made the large crowds in Snow Square laugh as well, with some even stating that one could tell she was a malark. Rue and Gail were escorted through the streets of the Capital within a blacked-out car, whilst wearing ear-cancelling headphones, 
lest they hear people on the streets shouting about the identities of other tributes. Although the streets had been full of citizens and cheer when the female tribute from District 10 had been the first to arrive in the capital at midday, most of these citizens had now returned to their homes after realising that they had no chance of seeing or being seen by the reap tributes. Once Rue and Gale arrived at the accommodation building, the car returned to Ravenstill Station in order to collect the male tribute for District 12. They were quickly guided into the building by peacekeepers, before being greeted by Ariadne Fling, an excitable young lady who was tasked for this year's games as one of the identity keepers. The main duty of this role was to escort tributes, mentors and stylists to and from their quarters, whilst ensuring that they did not see or hear each other. As the opaque lift ascended, Rue asked Gale why the windows and even roof had been covered, to which Ariadne responded that they wanted to ensure the fairness and safety of the games. They soon arrived on the twelfth floor, and were led to a door on the right-hand side of the apartment, which had been allocated as the female side of the accommodation building. Shortly after entering the apartment, Rue looked around in a trance-like stare at the apartment's decor, just as her stylist hastily turned the corner into the main room. She gasped, and with tears in her eyes, stated that Rue looked just like she had always expected. Rue looked at Gale with a dumbfounded expression, and he introduced her to her stylist, Effie Trinket. Effie immediately advanced towards Rue and tried to embrace her, but Rue seemed to carol backwards and ask Gale if they had met. Effie answered this question by stating that although they had not met, she had always wanted to meet Rue and her brother, and that she looked just like her mother. Before Rue could even reply, Effie took out a tape measure and said that she wanted to get down to work immediately, before forcing Rue's head upwards by her chin and trying to take a measurement. However, Rue recoiled and shouted, stating that Effie had no idea who she was and that she was sick of people talking about her parents when they had never met them. Rue stormed out of the main room and into what she thought was her bedroom, yet she had inadvertently walked into the bathroom and had to walk back out into the corridor and then into the room that was her bedroom before slamming the door whilst Effie and Gail looked on in disappointment and surprise. After a few minutes, Gail entered Rue's bedroom, and Effie remained in the main room. Although the cameras in Rue's room did not have brilliant sound quality, they were able to capture the conversation that ensued. Gail asked how Rue was feeling, to which she replied that this was a stupid question, which Gail admitted. He then said that although Rue did not always want to be compared to her parents, she and her mother had likely had very similar reactions to Effie when they first met her. Rue seemed confused, and asked Gail what he meant. He spoke about how Effie had been the escort for Peter and Katniss during both their games. This position had become defunct since the reclamation, and so Gail explained that as the escort, Effie had greatly helped Rue's parents to reach their potential both times. Gail added that Katniss had told him about her disagreements with Effie, and that Peter had often bridged the gap between the pair. Rue grinned, and asked how they had ended up together, which made Gail laugh, and he said that there were times when he wondered this as well. Yet Rue said that although she might have reacted too strongly to Effie's over-familiarity, she did not want to be treated like a puppet, in the same way that Effie probably treated her tributes last year as well. Gail smiled again, and said that the last tributes Effie had worked with were Peter and Katniss, and that earlier that day, she had begged to take the place of Rue's assigned stylist, when she saw her reaping from Snow Square, and that she had willingly offered to be imprisoned in the apartment with them for the next few days. Rue was visibly shocked by this admission, and Gail said that she should at least let Effie take her measurements. Gail left to the main room, and after a few minutes, Rue came out of her bedroom and apologised to Effie for her earlier outburst. Effie quickly forgave Rue, and admitted that she was also at fault, and that due to her overexcitement at meeting Rue, she had forgotten how tired Rue must have been after the journey. Gail then suggested that they start early tomorrow instead. This was agreed, and the three went to their separate bedrooms. That night, Rue knocked on the wall a few times, and seemed to be trying to hear the male tribute whose bedroom was just the other side of the wall. But despite trying in various ways, neither he nor Rue had any success, due to the soundproof materials within the walls. The next day, Gail awoke Rue early, and before she had even risen from her bed, he was testing her on whether certain flowers were poisonous or not. As they waited in the main room for their breakfast to be delivered in the meal shaft, Effie emerged from her bedroom in a luminous orange outfit, which made Rue stare at her in disbelief. Rue asked if Effie always dressed like this, to which she responded that it would be a shame to not wear a special outfit for a special occasion. Rue stated that it was too early for her to look at this colour, 
and she headed back to her bedroom. But Gail stopped her and told her that they had a lot to accomplish that day and that she needed to cooperate. Rue rolled her eyes and headed back to the table. After their breakfast, Effie took Rue's vital measurements, whilst Gail explained how this year's parade would be different. Instead of a standard parade with the 13 chariots, each tribute would display their district-themed outfit on a specially created catwalk that had been constructed within the interview studios before introducing themselves to the capital in 30 seconds. They would then be taken back to a holding room, and Ennius and Eugenia would discuss what they thought of each tribute before the next tribute's introduction. Effie initially wanted to dress Rue in a teal-coloured dress that paid homage to the medical background of District 12, but Rue stubbornly stated that she had previously vowed to never wear teal again, and that she wanted to wear some fire in her outfit, as this was linked to the coal that used to be mined by her district, and was synonymous with her parents. Effie seemed quite taken aback, and stated that her coal-themed outfit may be inappropriate, but just as both the ladies' voices started to become louder and more pointed towards each other, Gail stepped in and suggested a compromise, in which Rue would wear the teal dress that Effie had designed, but with faux flames that would rise from the bottom of the dress until it became entirely black. Rue seemed happy with this idea, but Effie said that this would be difficult for her to produce on her own. However, she quickly got down to work on the dress in her bedroom, although she said that in return, Gail would need to practice Rue's introduction with her. Over the next hour, it became clear that Rue was not pleased to have to talk to capital audiences about herself, even for the mere time of 30 seconds that was required. She asked how she was supposed to make the capital like her, when they likely knew already that she hated them. Gail contemplated the situation, before advising Rue that if she could not make the capital like her, she should focus on making them interested by her. They proceeded to edit the cards that Effie had already made, so that instead of Rue talking about how she was pleased to use her medical skills, and represent her district, she instead spoke about her hunting prowess and abilities with a bow and arrow, without any mention of her work on the local burn ward, which was one of Rue's more traditional skills. Gail also suggested that she remember the main points instead of each exact word, and that if she became nervous, she should simply imagine that he and Crimson were stood behind the camera. After their lunch, Effie came out of her bedroom with the completed dress that now contained the faux flame installations and recalibrators. Rue was delighted to try on the dress, and she exclaimed that although she hated the original colour, she loved how it changed, and that Effie had done a brilliant job. Tears of pride appeared in Effie's eyes, and she thanked Rue, before asking to see her introduction that would be seen the next evening. Rue agreed, and Effie was relatively pleased with how Rue sold the outfit although she reminded her to walk more like she was a desired figure throughout the capital, instead of trampling through a forest for whatever beasts lie in the depths of your district. Despite Rue looking at Effie in an extremely bemused manner after hearing this comment, she reached the end of the catwalk and introduced herself. However, Effie almost immediately stopped her, before checking the text that had been created by Rue and Gale, then asking in an almost despairing manner about why her tributes never stuck to the cards. Yet Gail convinced her that this was a more authentic introduction for Rue, and Effie was eventually convinced. The next evening, the introductions were broadcast live on Capital TV, with one of the largest crowds ever amassing in Snow Square. Unbeknownst to Rue, Gail, and Effie, many of Rue's opponents seemed rather phased by this unconventional first impression that they were offered to give to the Capital, and Eugenia stated to Ennius that it was amazing how unconfident the tribute seemed to be without a district partner or an audience. Towards the end of the introductions, it was Rue's turn. Despite Eugenia initially stating that Rue looked ready to faint, she slowly, yet confidently, walked down the catwalk until she reached the X spot for the introduction to the cameras. Rue then placed her arms out to her sides, and the flames licked up from the bottom of the dress, appearing to turn the teal silk into a crisp black material, until it was all completely covered. Cheers erupted through Snow Square, but Ennius asked why Rue had done this, and he stated that it was not representative of her district, although Eugenia said that this was in fact very wise of Rue to show both the past and the present of her district. Yet as Rue lowered her arms again, they quickly quietened themselves so that they could hear her introduction. Eugenia had previously been disappointed by how many of the other tributes seemed to be regurgitating memorised chunks of texts, but she said that Rue appeared more relaxed and genuine. Therefore, due to Rue's strong catwalk performance and introduction, she quickly became a capital favourite overnight, despite Ennius talking about how overrated she seemed. 
For the next two days, each tribute was allocated two sessions of three hours in one of the three adjacent training rooms that had been specially constructed for one tribute and their mentor to use at a time. Ennius and the assessors watched from behind a one-way mirror, which allowed them to see the tributes without the tributes seeing them. For most of Rue's first session, she practiced shooting arrows at a plethora of virtual targets, which greatly impressed many of the assessors. Gale tried to convince Rue to fight with some other weapons, but when she seemed unwilling to use anything but a bow and arrow, they instead worked on her defence strategies in close combat. Gale deliberately used an array of different weapons, and after Rue had some trouble defending herself, he said that he simply wanted to remind her that she could be attacked in ways that were practised by a variety of tributes that she had yet to meet. Yet as the session went on, Rue appeared to improve her agility and reaction times. During her session the next day, Gale made Rue revise survival techniques, such as creating shelter from foliage and fire from wooden sticks. Rue stated that Crimson would do better in these exercises, but Gale told her to imagine that Crimson was with her in the arena and instructing her on what to do. This appeared to make Rue upset, but Gale told her there was no time to cry and that she should carry on, which eventually had the desired effect of making Rue use this training time to its full use. The tributes were not informed that instead of the standard assessment that would normally take place separately, they were being assessed throughout their training for the strengths and weaknesses that they showed. As Rue and Gale were waiting to be dismissed from their training room, an assessor entered and told Rue that they had decided on her score and that she and Gale were free to leave. The assessor then left without another word. Both Rue and Gale tried to follow him from the room, but the door had already locked again. They were then escorted to the lift by Ariadne Fling, and as they headed up to the 12th floor once more, Rue speculated about her score. It was revealed to Capital viewers that she had scored a 10, which tied her in second position. Once Ariadne had seen Rue and Gale back into the apartment, she said felicidades to Rue and winked, before locking their door once again. Neither Rue nor Gale appeared to understand what this word meant, and even Effie, who had been designing a new dress for herself in the main room of the apartment, was clueless. However, Gale said that he was sure Rue had performed well, before ordering their evening meal. The next day, Rue chose to wear a dark and relatively simple dress for her interview, that she had chosen herself with Effie's approval. Although Effie had initially been against what she called a drab set of racks, she stated that she would allow Rue to wear this dress if she practiced some questions and answers, which Gail eventually convinced Rue to agree to. Effie at first asked Rue some rather typical questions about her life in District 12 and what her strengths and weaknesses were, but she soon became more personal, asking Rue what she would say to her parents if they were still alive, and if she would be willing to become intimate within the arena for sponsorship, along with other questions of this sort. Gail objected to hearing the answers to these questions, but Effie insisted on continuing, stating that Rue's father had dealt with questions that were just as tough during his interview. However, whilst Rue appeared to fight back other emotions, she said that she would tell her parents that she loved them, and that she would become intimate with Game Maker Fling herself if it meant surviving the games. Although this made Gail look at Effie with annoyance, Rue stated that she was just saying what they wanted to hear, and Effie proudly clasped her hands together before smiling widely and exclaiming, Beauty and brain! before letting out a short and high-pitched laugh. The interviews occurred the next day, in the same studio in which they were normally filmed, but no audience was present this year, due to an audience member potentially letting a tribute know the identity, strengths, or weaknesses of another tribute. Yet a large gathering once again took place in Snow Square, and the atmosphere was reported to be just as jubilant as that of a normal interview's audience. When Rue's interview occurred, she was still clearly intimidated by the lights and presence of Eugenia and Ennius, who were conducting the interviews together this year. They proceeded to ask Rue the kind of questions that Effie had initially asked her, and she managed to answer them in a calm and dignified manner. However, halfway through the interview, Ennius asked Rue why she thought her parents had not won the 76th Hunger Games. Eugenia quickly shot him a look, and daring laughter echoed through Snow Square. Yet Rue simply blinked twice, before stating that although she had never watched these games, Inabaria Golding had been from District 2, which meant that Capital Citizens most likely gave her plenty of sponsor gifts that helped her to win these games. Bewildered conversations quickly flowed throughout Snow Square, and even Ennius raised his eyebrows in amazement, but Eugenia quickly steered the conversation back to the more traditional question of whether there was a boy back home, 
to which Rue replied that there had been one, but that he was too nice. Effie and Gail had been watching these games in the apartment. After hearing this, Effie asked Gail why Rue was incorrectly identifying Inabaria as her parents' killer, and Gail said that he had never wanted to reveal to Rue or Crimson that it was Ennius Dalton who had killed their parents, and so he said that it was Inabaria instead. Gail went on to explain that he always suspected that Ennius may end up in a position that would put him close to the games, and so if Rue or Crimson were reaped, he did not want either of them to have a reason to do anything stupid towards Ennius before the games had even started, which Effie appeared to understand. The interview wrapped up shortly afterwards, and Rue graciously shook hands with Ennius and Eugenia before leaving the stage. She was immediately escorted by Ariadne Fling back to her apartment, and just as Ariadne was about to close the door, she looked Rue in the eye, before saying, Puisse le sort vous être toujours favorable, and locking the door. Gail had been within earshot, and Rue asked him if he understood Scottish, but he shook his head. Effie quickly came over to congratulate Rue on her fine performance. As she embraced Rue, she asked Gail if he was pleased that she had asked Rue those naughty questions the day before, and he reluctantly grinned and nodded, before embracing Rue as well. After the trio had finished eating their supper, Gail brought out a letter from his bedroom, which was addressed to Rue and Crimson. Rue asked who this letter was from, and Gail explained that her parents had written it the night before the 76th Hunger Games, and that they had instructed Gail to give it to Crimson or Rue, if either of them was ever reaped for the games. As Rue opened the letter, Effie suggested to Gail that they leave her alone to read it, and they headed to Gail's bedroom. It could not be seen what this letter said, but when Rue finished reading it, she let out a few tears, before asking Gail and Effie to come back. Ruth thanked Gail for having raised her and Crimson, before telling Effie that she was sorry for having been rude to her when they first met. Although Effie began to cry, she let out a small laugh and said that Rue had nothing to apologise for. Early the next morning, Rue, Gail and Effie were transported to the arena in a train of 26 carriages that had blacked out windows. The journey took approximately two hours, and almost ten minutes after arriving, Rue, Gail, and Effie were quickly whisked into holding room 8 before the next tribute was allowed to exit from their carriage. Due to an unfortunate communication issue earlier in the week, one of the identity keepers, Harper Harrington, had accidentally sent the female tribute from District 7 into the apartment for the male tribute from District 7, which had caused them to see each other. Both tributes were subsequently withdrawn from the games, and that evening, Harper sadly threw himself from the roof of the accommodation building most likely because of the guilt that he faced from his mistake. Rue was kept in her holding room with Gail and Effie for the next 20 minutes. The remaining tributes were individually led to their holding rooms, and Rue was instructed to dress in a dark green jacket and set of trousers, along with sturdy black boots that were provided. Effie spent this time arranging Rue's hair, whilst Rue asked Gail some final questions about the games. He responded that she might not recognise the male tribute from District 12, and that she should be careful about trusting anyone. The one-minute tube call sounded, and Gail said to Rue that she would see them again. As Rue was about to get into her tube, she gave Effie, and then Gail, a final embrace. He whistled a four-note tune, and after Rue had entered her tube, she whistled it back. Effie nodded in an encouraging manner, and as Gail tried to hold back his emotions, Effie placed her hand in his. Rue also looked like she was about to cry but she breathed out and closed her eyes. Seconds later, her podium rose into the arena. This year's arena was known as the Land of Opportunities. The arena was one of the largest that had ever existed. At the very centre lay an enormous cornucopia field, which was surrounded by six sectors of equal sizes, but extremely different designs. The sector immediately north of the cornucopia was filled with steep, rocky mountains that were covered in various depths of snow and almost reached the roof of the arena. The next sector clockwise initially seemed like a barren and dreary area, but upon close inspection, one would discover a network of cold and arid caves beneath the surface. Further to the south, the next sector's atmosphere was hot and dry, with sandy dunes of various heights scattered all the way to the perimeter. The sector immediately south of the cornucopia contained bright blue waters, with an archipelago of tree-covered islands that lay within. 
The next sector clockwise was a dense, sweltering jungle which housed a wide, undulating river that flowed through the middle of the valleys of enormous trees. To the north was a sector that was covered in dried mud, with a valley that was sparsely filled with tall, thin trees. Initially, 26 podiums had been positioned relatively closely to the small cornucopia structure. However, due to the withdrawal of the tributes from District 7, only 24 podiums were now needed, with four placed in front of each of the six sectors. In most past arenas, food and drink supplies were placed nearest to tributes podiums, then other useful supplies lay nearer to the cornucopia, and the weapons themselves were placed inside. However, in this year's arena, a range of bread loaves, cheeses, fruits, water bottles, sleeping bags, ropes, matchboxes, knives, spears, swords, bows and arrows were scattered between the podiums and the cornucopia in no apparent order or pattern. As the tributes podiums raised into the arena, most of them seemed to be adjusting their eyes to the sunlight from above, before they eyed their opponents, who they were finally seeing for the first time. As many of the tributes looked around, Eugenia said that she presumed they were looking for anyone they might recognise who could be their district partner, but Ennius said that he guessed they were looking for the biggest threat or the easiest target. Just as Ennius finished saying this, Gamemaker Fling made an announcement, welcoming tributes to the 90th Hunger Games and encouraging them to seize their opportunity. She then wished that the odds be ever in their favour, before beginning the countdown from 60 in her signature melodic voice. As the first half of the 60 seconds went by, most tributes began to avert their gaze from each other to the supplies that lay ahead, with some of them appearing puzzled by the positioning of various supplies. Other tributes began to look behind themselves, and then at the vastly different landscapes that lay beyond the central meadow, with Juliana from 5, Alexio from 12, and Rasheen from 14, appearing to eye the tropical jungle, the snowy mountains, and the sandy dunes that lay behind them respectively. Neptune and Helena, both from two, had made eye contact, and now appeared to be secretly signalling to each other about who or what they were aiming for. As for Phenomena and Cosma, both from one, neither of them seemed to have seen each other, but due to District 1's more sparsely distributed population and academy structure since the reclamation, it was no surprise that they might not recognise their district partner. Once Game Maker Fling had passed the mark of 30 seconds, most tributes were focusing on the supplies that lay ahead although Zuckerberg, from three, was still busy counting the number of other tributes and appeared perplexed by the two missing tributes. As for Rue, from twelve, she was placed in front of the island sector, between Mayambao, from nine, and Cosma, from one. Shortly after the fifteen-second mark, she was no longer looking at her fellow tributes, but instead eyeing the supplies that lay ahead. Rue noticed a bow and arrow that lay approximately halfway between her podium and the cornucopia, although when the countdown passed through five seconds, she began to realise that Cosma was also eyeing the same target. The gong sounded, and all tributes except for Juliana, Elixio, and Rasheen sprinted inwards. As Rue and Cosma ran, they quickly realised that they were both indeed heading for the same bow and arrow. They each ran at similar speeds, but Rue was slightly faster, although just as she was leaning down to grab the bow and arrow, Cosma jumped towards Rue and pushed her away from the weapon. This led to Rue falling over, onto a small bag of apples that lay just beyond the bow and arrow. As she tried to get back up to her feet, Cosma quickly placed the arrow inside the bow, before turning it towards Rue. Yet just as she seemed ready to fire the arrow, Rue grabbed the bag of apples and threw it with great force at Cosma. The bag hit Cosma's face. She fell backwards, dropping the bow and arrow, and it could be seen on a replay that her right eye was now bleeding. Rue wasted no time and as the first kills began around the cornucopia, Rue practically threw herself towards the bow and arrow that Cosma had just dropped, and fortunately for Rue, the arrow had remained in the bow. Cosma angrily charged back to Rue, but when she was within less than a metre of the arrow, Rue released it, and Cosma's neck was instantly impaled, which caused her to fall to the ground while she grabbed her neck. Cosma began coughing blood, and Rue scarpered backwards along the ground, with the bow and arrow still firmly at the ready, she watched as Mayambao from Nine ran into the jungle sector to her left with a loaf of bread and a sword, whilst Treble from Four helped Kimbu from Four into the dune sector to Rue's right, with Kimbu limping due to a knife that had hit her left thigh, although she was still managing to hold a large amount of food that the pair had taken from the cornucopia. Rue's attention was quickly brought back to the events taking place in front of her. 
She watched in a trance-like state, as Phenomenon from one ran his sword through the heart of the boy from five when he tried to run past. She then looked to the right, when Neptune from two was using his impressive muscular strength to continuously smash the head of the girl from eight against the side of the cornucopia. Yet it was Helena from two who seemed to attract Rue's attention the most, while she impaled the boy from eleven through his chest with a spear. As his blood spurted against Helena's face and platinum hair, she grinned and proceeded to shake his blood from her hair, with Eugenia stating during the replay that Helena looked like she was in an advert for hair products. Appearing to realise that there were not many surviving targets left within the cornucopia field apart from herself, Rue rapidly came to her senses and grabbed the bag of apples, along with a bottle of water that lay just to her left. Whilst Rue was collecting these supplies, Phenomenon, who was stood near Helena and Neptune by the cornucopia, asked if they were from District 2. Neptune nodded in affirmation, and Helena, whose face was still covered in blood, licked her lips and rubbed her hand along the spear that she held as she looked at Phenomenon. He quickly suggested that due to their lack of knowledge about other tributes, it would be best to work together. Neptune put his hand on Helena's shoulder before asking what she thought, and she flippantly nodded in agreement before looking to her left to see that Rue was still alive, and her eyes widened with clear glee. She rubbed her hands up and down the spear and started to walk in Rue's direction. Neptune then agreed to Phenomenon's idea before asking where his district partner was, whilst Helena grinned at Rue and slowly walked past Owain from 14, who appeared to have died. Yet just as she looked ready to charge towards Rue with her spear, Owain suddenly got up and ran after Helena with a knife. Rue had seen Helena's excited face, and she looked ready to shoot her with an arrow, but as Owain ran up behind Helena, Rue appeared to think very quickly before shooting him instead. Even though Owain was quite a distance from her, she managed to shoot him directly through the heart, and he fell to the ground behind Helena, who had only just noticed him. Phenomenon then gestured to Rue, and said that she must be his district partner. As Rue continued to sit on the ground in shock at what had just happened, Helena looked around at Owain's body, before nodding courteously at Rue. Helena then skipped back to join Neptune, who was finishing off the girl from Nine. Phenomenon slowly walked towards Rue, who still seemed concerned, with her bow and arrow at the ready. As Phenomenon slowly neared Rue, she lowered her arrow, but still seemed wary and perplexed. He proceeded to introduce himself to Rue, before shaking her hand and helping her to her feet. Rue introduced herself as Rue, and Phenomenon gave her a slightly strange look, but she quickly followed that it was short for Ruby, and he seemed to understand, asking if she preferred Rue or Ruby, to which she responded that she preferred Rue. Whilst they stood and watched Neptune and Helena gathering the supplies, Phenomenon explained that he wanted himself and Rue to ally with them, as they knew nothing about the other tributes, and after a moment of apparent thought, Rue agreed. Phenomenon then said that he would introduce Rue, and they headed towards Neptune and Helena. Although Phenomenon looked content to have found the person he thought was his district partner, Rue's face was a picture, with Eugenia saying that she could not wait to see how this turned out. As they approached Neptune and Helena, Phenomenon said that he did not recognise Rue, but that he studied at the Richland Academy, before asking which academy she studied in. Rue paused, and just as Phenomenon looked at her, waiting for an answer, she sneezed extremely loudly, although according to her vital measurements, this had not been a real sneeze. This made Phenomenon laugh and Rue apologise before stating that she was from the Harrison Academy and Phenomenon nodded. When they reached the central platform, he introduced Rue to Helena and Neptune, with Neptune quickly stating that he was impressed by Rue's skills with the bow and arrow, whilst Helena seemed slightly cold, but she shook Rue's hand nonetheless. The quartet proceeded to have a brief discussion about what they knew of the other tributes. They looked at each fallen tribute's body and tried to work out which district each of them was from, with Helena saying that the boy from Eleven had tasted like an outlier before biting her finger. Rue was standing behind Helena, and she gave her a strange look upon hearing this comment, but Neptune laughed, before seeing Cosma from One crawling slowly towards them and pointing at Rue, with the arrow still sticking out through her neck. Neptune quickly alerted the others, and as Rue saw her, she panicked and readied her bow and arrow. Cosma was still pointing at Rue and trying to say something, but Rue shot the arrow straight at Cosma's forehead, and she fell back to the ground. Rue appeared relieved, whilst Neptune asked which district Cosma was from, with Helena laughing and stating that she was probably an outlier. Over the next few minutes, they gathered the remaining supplies, and the topic of conversation soon turned to which sector they should enter first. Each of them looked around in a pensive manner, 
but Helena suddenly stopped when she looked towards the mountain sector and appeared to spot two tributes who were slowly walking up the side of a snowy hill in the centre. Helena alerted the others before licking her lips and saying, easy prey. Neptune looked at Phenomenon and Rue in order to see if they had any objections, and when they each nodded contently, the group began to head north, through the cornucopia and towards the mountain sector, where Cornelia from Ten and Jacaranda from Eleven had headed. As they marched through the green grass that slowly morphed into snow, they counted the nine cannons that sounded, which meant that there were fifteen tributes remaining. Helena eagerly led the pack across the flat plain of snow in front of the nearest mountain. As they began to walk up the mountain, they noticed that Cornelia and Jacaranda were hastening their ascent of the hill, but both girls were already exhausted, and Cornelia stopped towards the top of the hill. To further hinder their movement, the temperatures at this height were remarkably cold, with icicles forming in Cornelia's hair, which were causing her to shiver. After unsuccessfully pleading with Cornelia to hurry, Jacaranda left her and continued onwards. When the careers and Rue had travelled approximately halfway up the hill, Neptune suggested that they get them from here. Helena asked what he had in mind, and he put his hand on Rue's shoulder, grinning suggestively. He said, get the top one first, clearly implying to hit Jacaranda, who had almost reached the rocky terrain, where she could potentially hide. Rue seemed taken aback by this request, but Aeneas humorously mentioned that she would have to go along with this request, or it may blow her cover. The career tribute stood behind Rue, probably for a decent view of this shot, and they encouraged her as she readied the arrow in her bow. She readied her aim, closed her eyes, and let the arrow fly. In less than a second, it hit Jacaranda in the back of the head, when she was just metres from the rocks ahead of her. Phenomenon, Neptune and Helena each cheered as Jacaranda's movement ceased, and she fell backwards, before sliding down the hill past Cornelia, leaving a trail of blood as she did so. Whilst Jacaranda slid towards them, Neptune shouted that they should each try to hit her with a knife on the count of three. After a quick countdown, the trio threw their knives and Phenomenon managed to hit her in the heart. As Jacaranda's cannon sounded, Neptune and Helena cheered and applauded. Rue initially seemed shocked by this brutal display, but she quickly turned around and applauded Phenomenon. He grinned and bowed, before reminding Rue that there was still another one. Cornelia was now crying, and with the icicles forming on her fingers, she desperately tried to continue up the hill towards the rocks. As Rue readied her arrow, Cornelia turned around and appeared to mouth the word please, but Rue let out a sympathetic smile before letting the arrow fly. Less than a second later, it hit Cornelia in the head, and her cannon immediately sounded. Phenomenon, Neptune and Helena applauded once again, with Phenomenon stating that Rue was on fire. Rue grinned and curtsied, then Helena walked over and inspected the trail of blood that had been left by Jacaranda's body, before placing her hands into the snow, closing her eyes, and breathing deeply. The group spent the next few hours exploring the sector, whilst discussing what it had been like to be isolated with their mentors and stylists. During the late afternoon, they sat on the side of one of the northeastern mountains and looked out at the other sectors of the arena. They could not see anyone moving from this point, but they soon speculated about what lay within these sectors. The sun began to set, and the pack agreed that they should not spend the night in this sector, as it would be too cold, and they discussed where they should head next. Helena quickly suggested that they go to the island sector that lay opposite, and Neptune agreed, stating that he had always wanted to drown someone. Yet before Phenomenon or Rue could weigh in, Helena said that she had always wanted to kill an outlier, and Neptune joked back that she may have already done so, and that they would find out when they saw the portraits at midnight. Shortly after Rue heard this comment, her eyes widened, and Aeneas said that maybe she had finally realised that when these portraits were shown, her allies would learn that the real tribute from one had been killed, and that Rue was lying. Whilst Helena and Neptune continued to joke, Rue somewhat desperately suggested that they head to the sector to their east, which they had realised contained caves, before walking around the island sector the next day. Neptune seemed perplexed by this suggestion, but Rue said that other tributes would easily see them approaching the island sector, and that it would be harder to traverse once it was dark. Furthermore, they could hide and rest in the caves and potentially ambush other tributes. Surprisingly, Phenomenon quickly agreed with Rue's suggestion, and said that this would make more sense. Helena was initially rather adamant about going to the island sector, but once Rue argued her case further, Neptune also seemed convinced, and Helena eventually agreed to this plan. As darkness set in, the group travelled down a snowy hill and into the cave sector, 
before exploring their surroundings. They soon found the entrance to the cave system below, and after a brief debate about whether they should enter, Rue managed to convince them that they should. She tied one of their ropes to a small tree just outside the cave, explaining that they could use it to retrace their steps, whilst Neptune shared out their matchboxes. They then each lit a match and headed inwards. Helena quickly claimed that she feared the underground, and that she did not like the cold, but Neptune agreed to hold her hand and she eventually followed. The tunnels within this section of the caves were rather narrow at first, but as the group roamed deeper, the tunnels became wider, with more alcoves and crannies. Once they reached a large circular cave that appeared to be the deepest point within this sector, Phenomenon suggested that they had a look around for anything useful. Each of the four spread out within this cave, holding their matches up in front of them for light. Rue began to walk along a wet part of the ground, but just as she lit another match, she gradually noticed the outline of a petrified face against the wall. The following incident was replayed a total of 11 times during the end of day replay. Upon seeing this face, Rue quickly moved the match away and therefore left Rashim from 14 in darkness once more, before briskly walking onwards. However, Neptune had just looked over in Rue's direction, and as she walked onwards, the viewers saw through the night vision cameras that Neptune threw a knife through the darkness, which hit Rasheen in the head and sounded her cannon immediately. Helena screamed as Phenomenon jumped and asked what had just happened, but Neptune ran across the cave with his match to illuminate Rasheen, who was now lying slumped against the wall. He angrily asked Rue why she had not killed her when she saw her in the light of the match, but Rue denied having spotted Rasheen, before claiming that she had been looking away when Rasheen's face was illuminated. Neptune looked ready to ask Rue more questions, but when the Deathclaw made its way through the cave, Helena begged Neptune to drop this issue and for them to leave the cave, as there may be more tributes hiding. Neptune hesitated but agreed, stating to Rue that she needed to be more careful. She apologised and thanked him, but as the group followed the rope back to the cave's entrance, she could clearly be seen breathing a sigh of relief. As Rue suggested, the group spent the night in the entrance to the cave's tunnels, where they could see the land outside and keep themselves hidden. They ate and drank whilst discussing where they would head the next day. It was once again agreed that they would proceed through the dune sector before heading into the island sector. Yet as soon as this issue had been discussed, Phenomenon asked who was taking which night watch that evening. Rue appeared pensive for a few seconds, before suddenly saying that she wanted the second shift, explaining that she found it easier to sleep after midnight. The others did not object, and the remaining shifts were diplomatically divided between the group. Neptune agreed to take the first shift, and Rue rested in the cave entrance with him, whilst Helena and Phenomenon slept further inside. They discussed what life was like in their districts, and Rue's information was analysed, with Estelle Van Roosh, District 1's only surviving victor, confirming that a lot of this information was surprisingly accurate. Rue appeared to become tense towards the end of Neptune's shift, and he asked if she was tired, apologising for his outburst earlier, and even offering to take her shift. However, Rue insisted that he got some sleep, and when he eventually headed into the cave, she was seen to breathe out yet another sigh of relief. Just two minutes later, Horn of Plenty played, and Rue quickly looked around, probably in order to check that her allies were not able to see the sky. The portraits of Cosma from 1, the girl from 3, the boy from 5, the boy from 6, both tributes from 8, the girl from 9, Cornelia from 10, the boy and Jacaranda, both from 11, and Owain and Rasheen, both from 14, were all shown, which left only 12 tributes remaining. As the sun rose, Phenomenon awakened Helena, Rue and Neptune. They exited the cave and sat out in the open, looking for any other tributes, but they did not appear to see any, even though Juliana, from 5, said that she could see this group from the edge of the river in the tropic sector, where she and Zuckerberg, from 3, were resting at the time. After a brief breakfast of cheese and grapes, the quartet carried on into the dune sector. Helena was clearly the most pleased of the group to be in this new sector, delightfully stating that she never wanted to go back to those smelly pits again. Throughout the morning, they walked across the hot sand towards the other side of the sector. At one point, Neptune said that he had seen a game in which a hazard had occurred in one of twelve sectors each hour, and that something like this could happen within this arena. The others in the group seemed intrigued, and Neptune explained that they should be careful of their surroundings, as hazards may be triggered at any time. When the midday sun was highest in the sky, the group was so close to the island sector that they could hear the waves crashing against the sandy shores. However, due to the heat, Rue suggested that they rest for some water and food, 
which the others agreed to. After approximately half an hour of eating, drinking and looking for any movement within the islands and seas, the group were ready to move on to this sector. Yet as they began walking, an announcement suddenly began. Game maker Fling said that she hoped the surviving tributes were enjoying this arena, before joking that she had given them a variety of choices of where to stay, and so they should be enjoying themselves. She then stated that in order to show how generous the capital were, each tribute would be gifted with something pleasant in the centre of their sector's perimeter, before wishing that the odds be in the tribute's favour and ending the announcement. The group looked at each other, and Neptune pointed out that they may find other tributes if they headed to the perimeter, but that due to the proximity to the island sector and the weight of their supplies, it was not worth heading all that way. Rue suggested that Phenomenon, Neptune and Helena carry on to the shores of the island sector, and that she could grab the gifts for the group, but Phenomenon responded that he would go with Rue, which he seemed somewhat unwilling to agree to. The group split, with Rue and Phenomenon walking northeast across the dunes. As they walked, Phenomenon mentioned that if there were more than four gifts, it would mean that there were other tributes in the sector, and they should be ready to attack, and Rue quietly nodded in accordance. Phenomenon asked why Rue volunteered to collect the gifts, to which she responded that she needed a break from Helena, and he appeared to understand. He also asked Rue more about life in the Harrison Academy, and she explained that they specialised in archery and diplomacy. Yet Rue deliberately appeared to steer the conversation back towards Phenomenon, and as they neared the centre of this sector's perimeter, she asked him what life was like in the Richland Academy. Phenomenon said that they specialised in hostile environments and pain standing. He went into more detail about the latter, as the gift point became visible over the horizon of the nearest dune. As they neared the gifts, it seemed to become visible to the pair that they were each in small bags, but once they had walked within a hundred metres of them, Eugenia said that it was now probably noticeable that each gift contained the district number of the tribute that it was for, and Rue's skin rapidly became pale when the numbers came into focus. She offered to grab them whilst Phenomenon kept watch, but he refused, saying that he would come with Rue. She appeared to look panicked as they approached, and the number 12 became clearly visible on the far right bag. Rue immediately exclaimed that there must have been an error with the printing of the bags, before seeming to become flustered, and stating that Neptune or Helena must be lying about their district. Yet whilst Rue continued to insist that this must be the case, Phenomenon looked her straight in the eye and let out a grin. Phenomenon readied his sword, before letting out a small chuckle and saying, Anybody from one knows that the Harrison Academy has never existed.